Thank you all. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here um, as part of Chicago Humanities Festival Fall Fest 17. Uh, definitely let me thank again the Chicago Humanities Festival and also the Poetry Foundation and various people who have helped bring me here. Um, besides Jonathan, I, I should mention Brett, Tiffany, Miriam, Crystal, Rashida, and then there are, there are others that I, that uh, I, there's too many to name. Um, I also need to thank the University of Illinois um, and give a shout out to the Prairie Research Research Institute, which is the organization um, that, uh, under which all of the state scientific surveys are organized, including the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. <clears throat> and the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, as you'll see in some of my slides, and, and as I'll remind you, is really the group of people, uh, somewhere around 100 people across the state, who, who does most of the research and most of the compliance archaeology in the state of Illinois. It was a great service, uh, and I think re I couldn't be here, and we couldn't know what we know about the city of Cahokia and uh, and all of all of that in entailed in that without the Illinois State Archaeological Survey um, being there first. If you are interested in in what we're talking about today, especially Cahokia generally, its preservation in the future. Um, you may be interested in, a, in another conference at the University of Illinois, open to the public uh, in April, April 27th, actually, at, at the university. It's part of the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the university. And there'll be a gathering of archaeologists, native spokespersons, um, politicians, um, and with the, the, the idea being that we need to promote the preservation at a national level of not just what you see if you visit there today, but there's a whole host of, of other sites around there as part of this larger urban phenomenon that really we're just coming to appreciate. So I, I'm kind of guessing that maybe some of you um, might be wondering at this point, uh, what can an archaeologist say about faith and belief? Uh, how can an archaeologist uh, excavate belief? Uh, I certainly get that from, from students when I teach classes. Uh, mind you, an archaeologist who, who also like, is wearing a, a tie with like, little Mesopotamians marching across it, <laughs> which, which uh, you know, can you take me seriously, I think is the, is the question. And, and the answer partly is no, you shouldn't take me too seriously, or, or any, anybody who narrates the past. Um, but part of the answer that I, I'll try not to keep coming back to, but is, is to recognize first that outside of modern contexts where we think of beliefs as something up here, uh, people don't consider beliefs that way. Beliefs are not just what you think. Uh, they're what you do, such that it is difficult for, for many people to answer the question like, what do you believe? And you, can't all, you almost can't answer that if belief is what you do or what you experience in life. So that's partly how an archaeologist approaches the problems of faith and belief. Uh, and if you don't like that answer, then, then the reality is that um, 99 probably percent of all of human history is unwritten, and only archaeologists can access it. So you just have to, you just have, to have faith in us, ultimately. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the topic, the topic is serious, really. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to address today and, and in my research is questions of how, you, uh, how urbanism happens and how that is related to the building of an, of, a, uh, of an official religion from a background of more diffuse spiritual practices. Um, and then also how that's related ultimately to a loss of faith and the collapse of that, of that city and the civilization, Cahokia in this case, not that long after it, it began. So I'm gonna walk you through what well, you, you will appreciate, I hope, if I do this right, is a, a very rich material human history um, of this place, Cahokia, which is in southern Illinois. I mean, it's, it's the one major pre-Columbian urban center north of the Rio Grande, um, <clears throat> reason enough to preserve it, but also uh, um, to appreciate that it has lots of lessons for us um, um, to learn. The first one being that the human history of this place is not just human. Uh, a place like this, um, or most other early cities or early religious centers, wherever you are, 
um, uh, have palpable powers already before people ever get there. Um, and you know, there are energies there, there's a vitality there, there's a particular mix to things or relationships um, that people will arrive and perceive as otherworldly or as special or as a place to hang around. And that's a big part of the story um, of Cahokia. And the first person to realize that uh, for Cahokia is actually this man, Charles Dickens. Uh, and, he, and he experiences, that's not outside, that's actually in this room. Uh, hopefully the, the, the effects aren't that good, you won't feel any precipitation. Um, but he describes Cahokia um, and all of its affective properties, this kind of rich experience, in very negative terms. But he gets it right. Uh, he's, he's impressed, A, with the heat and humidity of St. Louis. Um, it can be miserable, as many of you know, Chicago's not that different in the summer times. Um, it's, 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 he describes it as a black mud hole, basically, of steaming earth. Um, filled with all kinds of creepy crawlies, and especially he did not like the frogs. Uh, Cahokia happens to be located in, in an area of the Mississippi River floodplain where there are a lot of lakes concentrated. That's partly why it's there, we now think. And the frogs were oppressive to, to Dickens' ears. But uh, for many people around the world, and certainly for native North Americans, frogs are great. Uh, frogs are special creatures that embody a kind of a power. And if you think about it, um, for people who value transformative um, power, where something changes from one state into another, and this would include many uh, Native North Americans and again other people around the world, the frog is the perfect embodiment of that. Right? It goes through metamorphosis, starts in the water, in eggs and tadpoles, ends up on land, on legs. Um, it's mostly active during full moon, so it's kind of marking the monthly lunar cycle. Uh, it also marks the springtime and the arrival of good, good time to plant. Um, and, you know, night from day as well, these frogs kind of mark that. So they're really fairly powerful creatures, and Cahokians revered them, as you can see in this particular Cahokian carving, where, they're co where the frog shaman is connected to rain um, um, by, by virtue of the kind of rattle that he's holding here. Now, this kind of transformative power is, you know, widely recognized across Native North America. And I just want to, I'm highlighting here so that you, when you see the later slides, you can make the connections. Here's a, here's a Lakota um, Hayoka, uh, uh, an impersonator or a ritual actor who's embodying here, um, among other things, the power of water or water spirits. And so that the, uh, the spiders are this creature that live in between worlds, right? They kind of build their webs in the air, but they're really attached to the ground, and then, and, and then the spider webs catch the morning dew, so it's this water, air, earth, in between creature that's very powerful. Um, and, uh, and he's burning, you know, burning uh, sweet grass and sending it skyward, again, another kind of transformation. This is where power resides for, for people, for many people, especially descendants of Cahokians. <clears throat> so, one of the best examples of this, and something that is intimately linked to the rise of Cahokia and its religion, is the steam bath. This is a later one, obviously, you know, uh, um, in the Northern Plains, among the Crow people, and, and what do you do in a steam bath? Uh, a, it has healing properties. Right? Inside, you inhale heat and steam, and there are modern medical uh, studies, somewhat controversial, but mostly people agree steam helps. You breathe it in. It alleviates the symptoms of the common cold, aches and pains in general, and also you can have the visible um, uh, sensorial kind of aspect of seeing the water turn into steam on the hot rocks and then you sweating. So the water basically is translocated, right? Believe it or not, formal steam baths like this, as far as we can tell right now, start at the beginning of Cahokia as an urban place. Um, and they mark the very beginning. As soon as there's a massive conversion, you see steam baths. Some of them are elevated on top of small earthen pyramids, much like they are actually in Mesoamerica. And so here's an example of a, a Cahokian excavation. Now you know Cahokia if you've ever been there. 
doesn't have standing architecture, doesn't have rock walls. Uh, you have to use your imagination a little bit, so get used to it now. This is the first slide of Cahokian archaeology where you can see there's a, they're excavating a circular uh, steam bath foundation with a central hearth, and this one had been rebuilt, so there's a couple of circles overlapping um, in, in the 1920s here. <clears throat> now, why a circle? Uh, in fact, it's a, there's a circle in Mesoamerica typically, and there's circles when you get steam baths up here. In fact, the Cahokians may have adopted their steam baths from Mesoamerica. But, uh, well, a circle is, an, is a, a natural um, phenomenon in the night sky before rain. And so this is a full moon with a 22 degree halo around it. I'm sure most of you have seen this at some point or, or not. It'll happen every year. So people can experience it every year. If you're living outdoors, if you're a farmer, you will be paying attention to this because two or three days after you see this, you'll have a warm front and you'll have rain, right? So the moon and the circle, these are connected to water and rain in, in particular. Farmer's Almanac still says the same thing. And leading up to the emergence of Cahokia as an urban phenomenon, which is, happens to be dated to the middle of the 11th century, that is uh, 1050 AD, uh, things are changing and more, uh, more rain and more warm weather is becoming part of what people are experiencing starting about 900 with the beginning of the medieval um, climatic anomaly. So this is just a a chart we're using uh, uh, tree rings to, to kind of extrapolate where uh, you would have had moist, warm conditions, and that's what this is showing you in Southern Illinois, basically saying the conditions right before, in this case a little after, 1050 are ideal, especially ideal for growing corn. And sure enough, corn appears now. Uh, we have good dates to suggest this happens. 900 AD, that's a full 150 years before this urban phenomenon that I'll be getting back to. Uh, why is that, why corn, and why does this even exaggerate people's concern with water and water spirits even more? Because corn, some of you may know, is an extremely water sensitive crop. It's not that it needs a whole lot, um, but it needs water at the right time. So basically, people engaging the, the rain gods is important because you need that corn crop to come through at the right, you know, at the right time. Too much water, they die. Not enough water, it dies. Uh, so starting at 900 and picking up steam, you start seeing people changing in part because they're growing this water sensitive crop and they're mostly going first to the floodplains uh, right around the Mississippi River, a nice black, that black steaming mud of Dickens, that's where they're growing their corn crops. What else is down there? Mussels around backwaters. They start using the mussels for tools. They grind up the mussel and put it in their pots. They are kind of, you can't escape probably the stench of dead and dying mollusks, which would have been, we would think, god awful. Um, also, they're processing the corn with lye to make it more palatable, you process corn with lye so that you make hominy. Sorry. You make hominy. Um, you also, however, need access to bedrock. And the bedrock limestone they're using happens to have fossils in it that also look like mollusk <laughs> shells. So this kind of redundant kind of association of people and water creatures is being made. They, they switch um, to using a kind of chert or flint that is coming out of that fossiliferous limestone that also has fossils in it of these mollusk-like brachiopods. Uh, and of course, they, their primary prestige object or ornament is mollusk shell from the Gulf of Mexico. They are thoroughly immersed in the world of water. They, can, they can't do anything. You can't cut a piece of meat, cook in a pot, uh, walk around town without you know, exuding water uh, all, all about your person. So. All right. So the beginning of Cahokia, besides that corn phenomenon, uh, then takes another step about 1,000 AD. And we've been excavating uh, Indiana University in Illinois. I've been excavating at a hilltop religious site for five, five years. Uh, where we have the first uh, identifiable religious shrines 
Um, these are small little buildings on top of a hill dating to about 1,000 AD. And, and this is some of our excavations in 2015. Uh, this, this particular site is a couple days walk east of, of uh, Cahokia, out in the middle of a prairie where there's very little water except what's trickling out of this hill. Um, and the whole complex seems to have been not a permanent settlement, but actually just a religious shrine complex filled with little, little kiva-like buildings, square initially, um, where, here's another shot, where they're, they're mixing water and clay and they're plastering floors and they seem to occupy these probably as prayer houses for periodic um, ceremonies. Uh, and then they'll leave and they'll go away and then they'll come back for the next ceremony back and forth to, from Cahokia to this site which happens to be called the Emerald Site. Now why? Well, initially, why? <clears throat> well, turns out uh, thanks to Mother Nature, this particular ridge was naturally pre-aligned to a, a lunar phenomenon. Uh, most of you don't know that the moon, uh, besides its monthly cycles, it has a long cycle. This is why we get the, you know, the, uh, the eclipses uh, every so often over this long period of time, because the moon isn't, doesn't revolve around the Earth in a, on the ecliptic of the, of the Earth uh, and the sun. Instead, it hits a little off angle, and it takes 18.6 years for the moon to basically rise and set in the same position on the horizon, right, where the sun, it takes one year. That's why it's a year. The moon, it takes 18.6 years. That ridge it happens to be aligned with the major northern standstill, it's some, sometimes called. Um, and at 10.50, Having experienced this and having aligned those little shrine houses that I just showed you already to that uh, standstill, that lunar phenomenon, 1050 comes, and there, this is the moment of urban change um, in this region. And out here, it looks like the Cahokians build a road out from their city, which is off in the distance back towards, maybe you can see the arch and the background, St. Louis is there on the horizon. <laughs> Uh, it's about, it's about uh, 24 or 5 kilometers out, um, uh, a, good, a good day's walk, maybe two. Um, they build a road, which you can still see in some aerial photos, believe it or not. Uh, and then they also build a whole series of new mounds. And they put those mounds in rows such that they align to not only the ridge, which is already aligned to that lunar event, but the mounds themselves line up in rows. Okay, there's one large earthen pyramid, that rectangular one there, and then there are 11 other um, circular mounds, much like those circular um, steam baths, right? And we now actually think that those little circular mounds were elevating special steam baths for people to come to this site to take part in the, in the lunar-related rituals. Not only that, they embedded that site, which is now that rectangle in the middle, within a larger landscape of mounds. So those distant points are all other circular mounds, possibly more of these elevated steam baths. Um, so you couldn't walk through this environment without, again, basically being clothed in kind of lunar water relationships. And thanks, thankfully, um, there were some sketches done of these mounds, so you can see the kind of circular platform that I'm talking about. These are the really important ones that have to do with steam baths. And in the background behind the, the 1840s uh, house, uh, you can see the, the larger, the pyramid that was, that's still there today. Um, it's really the only thing that's there, in part because the state bought that one mound, and then the rest of the site has been plowed for 150 years, heavily eroding it. If you look closely, you can see little bumps out in the field here. This is a LIDAR image, a, a laser, airborne laser scan image of the, of the ground. Um, besides being lunar aligned, the other really critical thing, and the reason why uh, later uh, Euro-American uh, settlers stopped here, was to drink out of this big spring. Um, uh, so this particular hill happens to have a perched water table in it, and whenever it rains, or even when it's not raining, in fact, we were there, through there this summer in the midst of a, a little mini drought, there's still water coming out of the sides of this hill. So it, it seeps out because of this perched water table. 
So again, water and the moon, that's what this place is about. Never mind that on top of the hill, all around those circular platforms are more steam baths. So this is, if you're not used to being, looking at archeological graphics, this might, you may not quite get this, but there are uh, the, the couple of maps of our excavations which show like layers and layers of buildings. And then there's a couple of, of plots of, of, of uh, like ground penetrating radar type information uh, where you see the dark dots and, and we, and using these, we can see more of these circular buildings all on the top of this, of this hill, which was at 1050 heavily sculpted by, by a big labor party. They cut the top of the hill off and they moved the dirt on the sides and they seem to have perfected that lunar alignment. So a lot, a lot of energy going into what is basically building this uh, religion. At this point, people are appreciating that there are these powers in, in this region, including at this hill, and they are actively kind of cultivating that, managing it, and making new associations between themselves and these uh, um, non-human powers. Uh, around some of these buildings, there are offerings. And if you're paying attention, you might think, well, what are the offerings going to be like? Uh, well, they might involve water. And so sure enough, a lot of things are left in water. And we know water because when you pour water over earth, you know, the, the earth kind of erodes and runs off into a puddle and you get that sort of silt that accumulates. We have offerings in layers of silt meaning that they were buried in water. And in that particular building I just showed you, right in the middle of where the, where the big central post of this relatively big prayer house had stood, um, was a uh, human body. Whoops, went the wrong way. Human body. And here, Susan and Sarah are coming down and realizing what this is and talking about, oh, what, okay, what, how do we approach this? You can't see it here by design, but there's a young girl um, right under the layer where they're working right now. And you can maybe see the swirly gray earth. That's the water laid soil, right? She was buried in a hole of water. <clears throat> she was later covered over with more earth, but initially it's all water um, after the central post of that building was pulled out. So, if up to 1050, this emerald site that I just showed you several slides of is kind of showing us how they're gathering or assembling these various spiritual powers of moon and water and earth and whatnot, Cahokia is the institutionalization of, of those powers. Cahokia is the building of a new religion, one that we, we see in descendants now. I mean, a lot of the myths and a lot of the uh, associations and religious practices are rooted here. They did it here, and that's why we see them among descendants. Uh, again, for the uninitiated, Cahokia is it's bigger than many cities in Mesoamerica. Um, it certainly is the largest by an order of magnitude or more of anything else in North America. It's the largest earthen pyramid, uh, the third largest in the Americas, um, the largest public plaza, uh, of, uh, maybe the largest in the Americas, uh, 50, 50 acres. Uh, People-wise, what you're looking at here would have had up to 10,000 people, and there are other pieces of other precincts um, at the city of Cahokia where there'd be another five to 10,000 more. If you look at the other way, you can also appreciate that, okay, if they're institutionalizing religion, they're doing it by also doing what they did at the Emerald site. They're, at 1050, they're laying out a whole new plan, some big idea such that if you're standing at the south end, that mound that's kind of in LIDAR right in front of us leads um, to a causeway, an elevated uh, highway-like um, of earth, goes right up into the, the main part of the site. And the foreground, all that would have been wet, still is, um, oftentimes. We, we worked there a few years ago. It's, it's kind of miserable, sort of like Charles Dickens would have experienced it, like frogs and bugs and all kinds of, of things back there. So that, that's not inhabited by living people. Instead, those loaf-like mounds that you see in front of us, that's one of five or six burial mounds at this end of the site. 
So to get to the burial mounds, you have to walk basically through a watery zone along this causeway from the land of the living, which is back there in the, other, in the main part of the city behind, behind uh, in the background. Uh, that was all built in 1050, as far as, as, far as we can tell now. Uh, including, the, like I said, this largest of, of plazas, 50 acres of leveled um, floodplain where thousands of people must have come in and dug away ridges and filled in low spots. And this is just one location that this is happening at 1050. It's a whole lot of desire to be a part of this. Whatever the Cahokians are doing, however they're putting the pieces together, it's working. Uh, another, another view. If you, if you need another one, showing the kind of relationships of that causeway to the main platform, the pyramid in the north and the burial mound in the south. Not too surprisingly for me, the, the axis mundi of the whole arrangement here is a little circular platform mound that's perfectly in alignment with that causeway and with a variety of other mounds off in the distance. Probably elevating a steam bath. Again, the transformation of, of water into steam and people's relationship to it is truly powerful. Whoops. <clears throat> the whole thing is actually aligned. I'm not going to explain that. But it's aligned to, again, to the moon and the sun in this case, sort of a benchmark kind of arrangement where uh, you can imagine a surveyor going there and say, all right, you know, the sun's there and the moon's here. Let's put the sight line right to the north. And they lay out everything else with respect to that benchmark and that baseline including other burial mounds, where um, one of the more startling things for researchers, especially the ones who found the first of these in the 60s and 70s, are that those burial mounds often are filled with human sacrifices. This is, this is the largest. This is a pit of 53 uh, women, primarily mostly women. There may be some gracile men in the bunch. Um, with four men laying nearby. This is one of seven or eight such pits in this one little mound. And there were 15 of these mounds at this site at one time, many of which destroyed. And also, they're lunar aligned. All dating just after 1050. So again, a huge amount of excitement, huge amount of effort, human sacrifices. Uh, it's even bigger than I've showed you because, again, there are, there are other major pieces of the city. It sort of sprawls into East Saint, contemporary East St. Louis and then hops the river, and there was a big cluster over on the St. Louis side as well. Uh, as you see here, right? a few from St. Louis, the Edward Jones Dome there is just to the southwest of, of where there had been a large, the large uh, precinct of Cahokian construction. Now, <clears throat> you can imagine looking, thinking about St. Louis, like, how do archaeologists know anything about that? It's completely bulldozed and buried or built over. And that is largely true. Uh, we are lucky with the case of East St. Louis, which is this precinct, where it turns out that the, uh, in the early 19th century, um, land was added. And basically, they buried the ancient precinct part of the ancient city of Cahokia. They buried, put a stockyards on top of it. Um, here are the archaeologists from the state survey excavating um, in the late 2000s. You can see the new, there's a new bridge that's going to go across the river at this point. Um, where they excavated, it was one of the largest excavations ever, ever in, in the world. Um, no one's done the actual number crunching to figure out wins. But they, they dug a phenomenal area. And they come up with things like this. So this is a remains of a storage pit where a lot of food would have been kept at one point. Later, garbage is thrown in. So you have layers within that one pit of refuse, broken pots, tools, animal bone. And you have enough of those pits like this, and several hundred were excavated just at this one dig. You can start telling a pretty good story of the history of who ate what, where, how are they related to those people over there. And from here, how are we related to the other, uh, other complexes around this region? It's an urban scale archaeology uh, comparable to anything you would know of from Mesopotamia or, or Mesoamerica. Uh, so here's just a glimpse, another glimpse to try to convince you of the scale. All those green rectangles are Cahokian houses. Each house that's in green has associated artifacts on the floor. Um, 
And I mean, there, uh, total, there were 1,500 such buildings excavated at this one, in this one excavation by the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. It's pretty amazing. One of the things we learned is this, how they were formalizing and institutionalizing that religion that I keep referring to. And it's happening through special buildings. Ortho, it's almost like an orthodox set of, of principles going into building a suite of, of, of uh, pole and thatch constructions that do different things. Like each, each a piece of the church, except separated. So here we have larger council or prayer houses, temples maybe, where 10 or 20 people would gather. Uh, there's the steam baths, the all important steam baths are always there. Um, and then the other really important building, and, and it becomes more important when we start looking at the loss of faith here, is what, I, what we're calling medicine lodges. And a medicine lodge is a, it's like a house, and there may have been a person living in it, but also living inside that is what we know later among Plains groups in particular as medicine bundles. So a medicine bundle is a group of animate or powerful objects or substances that are all wrapped up to create a really powerful oracle, right? Where people would go to and ask questions like, what do I do now? And the medicine bundle would reveal its secrets to people and they would act accordingly. Those are being kept in those T-shaped medicine lodges. All of this happens at Cahokia at 1050. None of these were there before. They happen at 1050 and you'll see they come to an abrupt end um, at one point soon. Uh, there's one under excavation. That's a, a medicine lodge. Get, give you a sense of the scale. They're not necessarily that big. Historically, as I was saying, uh, this is a Catlin painting. Historically, medicine bundles are more important than many of the people participating in any kind of ceremony. The whole ceremony couldn't happen if that bundle wasn't there. Uh, so this is a particular dance to the bundle. Um, and you'll notice that it's happening outside of a lodge. It's also in association with a pole, a kind of a slender little wispy pole. Um, Cahokians had these same poles, probably where bundles are hanging, right? And we, we know that because we occasionally find them. And they're much bigger, right? There's an urban, urban upscale version of the Plains sacred pole. This one happened to get, presumably they were trying to pull it out and it got stuck and snapped. It's a big cypress tree, uh, a meter across, three feet. And um, thinking back to that instance of that young girl we had at the Emerald site, you won't be too surprised to know that when those poles do get pulled out, presumably to be used somewhere else because they're sacred and they're going with a bundle, uh, offerings get put inside the hole, um, sometimes human offerings. So there's a, there was a um, youngish um, lady to the right, it's sort of a top-down view, and that's her down there. Her, her wrists and her legs looked like they had been bound. Um, and here's another one. This was a group of uh, 19 or so young women um, sacrificed and buried on top of where one of those posts had been pulled out of. Becoming really common to see this. Okay, so such was the power of those posts and the bundles that you had to uh, sacrifice human beings to them. You might imagine that might get old. There's been, there's been some work some work of like, who were these people? Uh, some chemical work on human remains um, by Chris Hedman and Tom Emerson at the University of Illinois looks like they're about half local, half non-local. So they're not all war captives. There's some local families being pulled into this. And it may have been a really honored thing, which is hard to imagine, but an honored practice where the spirits of these women get put into the ground at Cahokia, um, uh, making that place even more powerful, right? Uh, feminine powers, uh, not just girls in the ground. Um, carvings of goddesses are also prevalent. At Cahokia, they're typically associated with these lunar aligned um, shrine houses uh, with crops. She's presumably holding corn and sunflowers are growing out of her hands. She's a, probably a goddess. She's emerging from what we now think is a coffin. So she's coming from the land of the dead to bring people crops. Um, you see frogs, of course. Uh, the one on the right is a, is a female, she has long hair, and she is basically tipping a conch shell dipper, you know, a, a shell, 
full of, presumably full of water and kind of offering that to the, the world. Water, corn, the moon, these associations are like redundant there and they're, they're thick at, around Cahokia. Uh, yet one more, uh, this is the same goddess. Um, she's digging a garden hoe into seemingly the earth, but if you look closely, it's not quite just the earth, it's an animate being, a kind of an earth monster or snake and the snake's tail bifurcates and becomes two vines of gourds that grow up her back. So you're starting, you see how, imagine now, uh, uh, that, that these are all elements of an increasingly formalized religion. And it's, it's the gods of Cahokia are what we're looking at here. Occasionally, well here's a, here's a pot, Okay, uh, often you'll see these swirly wind water symbols often set in four quadrants of a pot, suggesting like the, you know, the various supernatural powers are associated with different directions. Occasionally you'll see a masculine carving. This one ends up in Arkansas. Uh, maybe not a god, maybe a demigod, or maybe uh, a hero, a culture hero. Um, you'll notice this particular character is wearing little earpieces that look like human faces, kind of like shield-shaped faces that show up all the way into historic uh, uh, myths of living people in Wisconsin, the, the Ho-Chunk. And of course, are also reminiscent of this, of this Lakota um, Hayoka that I showed you earlier. Those are the shield-shaped earpieces themselves that Cahokians made out of marine shell. They're probably little water spirits. Um, and then that morphs through time to become this Lakota uh, Hayoka. So, all right, let's get serious now though. So what, water, water, corn, everything is, is working very nicely. Things are being formalized, it would seem. What happens if you take away the water? And that's what happens. So, uh, unpredictably, uh, the medieval warm period is working its way through by the, by the 12th century, especially the mid 12th century, after 1100, especially around the 1150 era. Things do not look well. There are a series of mega droughts that look now to, to have occurred. So if you can imagine people who are so intimately bound to the water transpiration cycle and corn and all the sensitivity of that crop, to have water not show up, have the corn crops fail, <clears throat> what happens? Yeah, not, nothing good. <laughs> um, here's another version of a chart, and I try to plop some things on there to show you what's happening uh, when, um, again, the PDSI on the one side is the Palmer Drought Severity Index, so everything above the, the, the line that runs across is good. Everything below, especially when it gets big red, um, curve, uh, that's bad. And you can see it doesn't look good after 1100. This is only 50 years after they've set up this new city and they're building this religion. And they're probably in the midst of doing this when the rains stop coming. Or at least they're not consistent over the years. <clears throat> um, to jump ahead a little bit, uh, not too much, but um, farmers start leaving. Uh, farmers in the upland zones where uh, not enough water means no crops at all. They depart. We lose track of them in history. We don't know where they go. Um, thousands of people probably get up and leave. Uh, at some point, there are probably a series of critical ceremonial activities intended to try to bring the water back. It involves sacrificing of women in posts. Um, ultimately involves giving up on part of this, the East St. Louis precinct, which is a big chunk of it is burned, uh, probably in a ritual act of sending the whole thing back, you know, into, into the sky as smoke. This is a period when you see violence, uh, worries of, of fortifications, uh, 1150 or so, that's the Cahokia wall. Um, what are they protecting besides the inner core of the whole city of Cahokia? They're also especially singling out those medicine bundle lodges. This is another one that I tried to highlight here in this old excavation. That building was surrounded by a defensive compound wall. And each of those circular um, features are uh, bastions, right? Where archers would have stood on top to defend anybody trying to get inside and damage that medicine bundle. <clears throat> So 
There's trouble in River City. <clears throat> um, and the, the penultimate event is the burning of, of that one chunk of East St. Louis. That seems to be a major region-wide event uh, that marks a big change in urban Cahokia. Now, what changes? Not only do they eliminate one-third of the city of Cahokia in doing this, um, what disappears are all the official buildings of Cahokia, the medicine lodges that I've been showing you, the ones that were just protected, they disappear. The sweat baths or steam baths, those also go away. Uh, this is one of the last ones. Um, dates to around 1180, and those black things are burned logs as they burned it down. There may be a series of simultaneous burnings to kind of send it all, like to, something is put away or abandoned, or some people are driven out or they leave. Uh, more importantly, a whole series of medicine bundles, these oracle-like um, uh, objects seem to be taken away, and they don't build the houses where those things are kept anymore. It, uh, it's a major change. People start leaving. <clears throat> um, well, they were started already, but they really pick up the, the out-migration at this point. It, so effectively such that by 1150, Cahokia starts shrinking from an urban center on the order of tens of thousands of people to a, a small-scale town of a few thousand people by the time you make it into the late 1200s. Right? <clears throat> Um, interestingly, this big out-migration, unlike other founding cities in other parts of the world where there's a legacy or stories told about, oh, how great Cahokia was or how great Chaco or Teotihuacan or whatever were, there are no stories here that we know of that refer back to people who, were, who came from there as part of some bigger diaspora. There are none, as far as we know. It, it does look like Cahokia is being forgotten quite intentionally. <clears throat> so, to me, I mean, what, what's going on here? Uh, it, I mean, there's, there's a series of things you can put in rows, that is, uh, causal, the arrows, causal arrows can be arranged, you know, to point from, well, big droughts to, to absence of buildings that have all the, the religious powers embedded inside. To me, this speaks primarily of, a, yes, is environmental change, climate change, but it's primarily a loss of faith. I mean, people see the rain stop. And now, instead of all the, the religious power, spiritual entities being kind of everywhere in the landscape, where are they? They're at Cahokia. Uh, Cahokia has done a really good job of centralizing all those and all those medicine lodges, you know, in, in the steam baths, on top of pyramids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, such that when things don't go right, people abandon the city. They abandon the experiment. Um, and it's, it's not so much a loss of religious belief. I'm sure that, uh, in part because we know that it's some of the descendants, that you know, they don't lose faith in corn or water or, or thunder or powers at the you know, in-between worlds, um, water and earth into air, or matter into fire and smoke, life to death, all of that. No, they, they lose faith in civilization. <laughs> Uh, so, my question to you is, how do we avoid such a fate? How, how does anybody avoid such a fate, a loss of faith uh, like this that seems to spell collapse? Um, maybe you're thinking that I have the answer. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have the answer. Um, it's a really good problem, though. Uh, however, um, I think part of the answer lies in, in not forgetting that uh, spiritual power, as we've seen here, where is it? It's not necessarily in institutions or in abstract beliefs or religious dogma. It's in fundamentals, right? It's in elements. It's in the, the powers of transmogrification and translocation and all the ch things that change sta states of matter from one state to another state. That's, po that's spiritual power um, as people live it, 
right? especially as Native Americans lived it and continue to live it. Um, so this is human, this is non-human. Um, and that's where faith is. That's where faith is rooted for me. Uh, and that has to be part of the answer. Thank you. What do uh, you know about uh, bigger and smaller dwellings, elites, priesthoods, political leaders? Uh, what role do they play in the demise of the of, of Cahokia? Yeah, you know, it's, it's it, we thought it would, at one point we thought it was going to be simple uh, to identify elites versus non-elites or religious specialists from ordinary people. And the more we know, the more the, it's because it's more difficult to sort out who's where. That said, houses are, are always bigger in these central precincts. There's always more religious buildings in those central precincts. Um, there are pro probably uh, what elite means is not so easily it's not so stratified top and bottom. It's probably more general. There's a lot of participation. Um, if you're living at the, in the central city. You are more elite than, than farmers living outside, many of whom are immigrants, by the way. So it's tough to see them. We really think they're there. You can certainly find concentrations of special materials around some of those houses in the central cities, like production materials for making ear spools or pot smoking pipes or fancy <coughs> blades. Um, those, those ear pieces that I showed you, those are produced somewhere uh, around by a special household. Uh, so what I suspect, and I don't know this, but this is kind of my, my Marxist background coming out, right? It's like, <laughs> they're the problem. Yeah, but what happens is they start, people start embodying the powers that had been out there and were not, you know, the other than human powers. People start saying, basically, I can control the rain here. And come, come in here, bring your food in, we'll have a big party, and we'll keep, you know, what's ever, what's, whatever's left over. And they, they benefit from this sort of system of a religious kind of tribute payment. And they are becoming elites. And they also are the ones that take the fall when things don't work. And they're the ones who are left behind in some ways. I suspect that you probably have a whole priesthood with those, those buildings that disappear, the T-shaped. I bet that's a whole priesthood that's just, they're leaving. They're, they're on the outs. They may be unhappy themselves. It's hard to know, but they, they go. Um, so uh, that's kind of a muddled answer. There's some big historical involvement of actual people, yes, uh, especially in, in losing faith on the part of farmers, you know, of, of the center. Do the stories of the late Natchez Indians who were wiped out by the French uh, and the Soto uh, expedition give us some hints of what might be missing? Um, so. What you see there are, you know, centuries later, after much relocation on the part of people and much, much ethnogenesis, where you probably have ethnic groups forming out of the party folks out of Cahokia. Um, you see shadows, you know, of organizational features or particular practices. For instance, there's a, a, a Cahokian game, Chunky, where you roll a stone across a yard, invented that and promoted by Cahokia, and you do see that, people are playing that later. But the rules have probably changed, it's become a small scale affair. So you can, sort of, you can sort of start tracing lines back to the center, but there's so many broken lines, it's hard to, to do that. Now the one interesting thing is, <clears throat> with regard specifically to the French in your question, is you think about it, when the French move into North America and they come into Montreal or up to the city of New Orleans, they, they find an empty landscape in the Midwest, at, at least south of Springfield. You know, it's empty. Uh, around Cahokia, there are no people there. What seems to have happened is that the fall of Cahokia and all the ugly memories uh, associated with Cahokia means that people just absolutely vacate that zone. And maybe it's filled with ghosts. So the French arrive, it's like, there's this whole landscape. They just move right in and set up the, the, uh, the Illinois country colony. Yeah. So there's a, you know, a big historical connection, indirect. Can you tell us what the state of the Illinois Museum at Cahokia is? 
Is it still functioning? And what is there to see, uh, if anything, uh, by tourists and, and visitors? Right. So the Illinois State Museum, of course, is in Springfield, and that has reopened um, uh, a while back, thankfully. There's some exhibits there to see. The museum at Cahokia proper is, is there and open. I think it's closed Mondays and Tuesdays because of state you know, budget cutbacks. Um, it's a very fine museum, and you can see some reconstructions. You can see a lot of artifacts. Uh, and from that jumping off point, you go out and you can walk across the grounds, um, including the big plaza, you know, the big pyramid, back to some of those burial mounds that I was pointing out. Um, if you try really hard, you can see the causeway in the woods. Uh, so yes, it's there. It's, uh, I think it's a must for, for Illinoisans, because I mostly tell this to undergrad students uh, who, I, if I ask in class, like a world civs class, like how many even know what Cahokia is? You know, you get maybe a quarter at most of the class, you know, any sense for what this place was, even though it is the most important cultural location in the United States, period. Um, another reason it needs to be nationalized so that it gets more visibility right? and we, we learn more from it. You talked about um, at the end that Cahokia was burned and you seemed very definite that it was a fire deliberately set. And if it was so dry, how do you know it wasn't just burnt? <coughs> Um, there are several reasons, and none of them are, there's no smoking gun here. And we, we, we work through these reasons, um, and we keep trying to work on this problem to try to shore up that argument. Um, a few things. One, there are a lot of the buildings that are set ablaze, look like they're first, they're stocked with religious articles and food offerings. So at first they go in and they fill up the buildings, and then somebody burns them. Uh, um, Secondarily, it's patchy. So, I mean, you might expect that of a natural fire, it's not gonna spread evenly, but it looks like there's select buildings, even over in the main Cahokia precinct, away from East St. Louis, that are torched at the same time. Like there's some specific kin group or priest buildings that are being torched. Um, yeah, and then it's just basically down to the kinds of things that are left behind in some of these buildings. A lot of them are religious articles, you know, the, the little statuettes um, of the female goddesses, uh, agricultural tool offerings, um, all again suggesting kind of a staged event. It's still an outside chance that it's both, or it's some odd mix, you know. Uh, in, the, in the Southwest, there are plenty of ev uh, lines of evidence that show that, sure, sometimes, an inside, it's an inside job and an outside job because it's an inside faction and they invite, you know, they open the doors and invite the others to come in and help burn down the, the place. Um, that's possible. It's even possible that they do that ritually by both sort of honoring the people that they are ousting and burning out and also burning them out. It's, it's all possible. We have time for one more question. I'd like to ask, um, having heard you mention the term immigration, what uh, connections can you give us with other social areas of the then continent? Like who, who is involved in this movement? Right, primarily from regions nearby. Can you all hear me as I step away from this mic? Yeah. Primarily from regions nearby, the Blue Hill of Missouri, uh, Wabash Valley in Indiana. You can, you can just watch the pots kind of, that people must be carrying in that are going into Cahokia. Uh, there's some far flung, probably fewer people coming from the edges of the Great Plains, the Eastern Plains, up to Missouri a little bit. You can see some of their wares coming down. Uh, probably some <coughs> Illinois Valley, uh, Northern Illinois, maybe even some Wisconsin folks coming down, in part because there are Cahokian colonies up there right at the beginning. Uh, possibly funneling some people down. But primarily, it's, it's downriver, Boot Hill, and up the Ohio a little bit. Yeah. We don't see the warm weather uh, societies from the Gulf Coast, for example. No, no, uh, a, few, a few people. Colder climate. Uh, a few people from Mississippi, Louisiana, a few. Again, based primarily on the, the appearance of 
they're nice pottery. It, it almost looks like they go to Cahokia in small enclaves. They may just be representatives. We don't know how long they stay if they get there. Um, it's, it's certainly the case, however, that there's enough diversity going in there um, that it's probably, it's a multicultural city. You know, and there may be multiple languages or at least dialects being spoken you know, at the same time in that city. Uh, there's a really good bet of that. If, only, if you only look at the pottery diversity, um, it's like, wow, this is a Kadoan style pot. Kadoan languages are really different than Suan languages. They look like they're here together. 